All right, so welcome to this panel. It's called Defenders in Action, Protecting People and the Planet. My name is Kirk Herbertson, and I work at Earth Rights International, which is a human rights and environmental nonprofit based in uh, DC with offices in the Amazon and Southeast Asia. Um, I am uh, very grateful to the McCain Institute for um, including this session that's looking at human rights defenders issues, but also at environmental issues and climate change issues. Um, I think I can say personally that um, I talk about these issues a lot, but most of the time it's in an echo chamber. Um, so this is for me um, a really good opportunity just to hear, I guess we won't really get to discuss, but um, to start sharing some of these ideas and I look forward to other conversations afterwards. Um, I think this topic also reflects several of the principles that uh, Senator McCain embodied. Um, a few of them include uh, politics that looks ahead to future generations and not just to the short term, democracy and human rights, um, because we will be focusing on democracy and human rights elements of environmental issues, and yes, also um, climate change. And I was, uh, I was reading a quote from Senate, or reading an article um, from Senator McCain. He wrote in a 2008 speech, he was speaking about climate change, and here's what he said, and I think it's still relevant today. He said, we have many advantages in the fight against global warming, but time is not one of them. Instead of idly debating the precise extent of global warming or the precise timeline of global warming, we need to deal with the central facts of rising temperatures, rising waters, and all the endless troubles that global warming will bring. We stand warned by serious and credible scientists across the world that time is short and the dangers are great. So that was in 2008. Um, fast forward, I think it was 16 years um, to now. Um, so across the planet, including in the US, we are experiencing um, rising average surface temperatures. Uh, this year was the hottest year um, on record. And it was also the first year that um, the temperatures went above this uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold that is included in the, the Paris Climate Agreement. It was the um, 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels of temperatures. That means that the earth is warming. This was the goal that the international community set to try to prevent warming from reaching. And now we are starting to go into that space. Um, it was also the threshold where um, scientists considered it to still be okay. You know, we're experiencing some experience, we're experiencing some impacts, but, um, we can still manage. But um, the UN has said that currently we are on track for warming of 2.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That's, um, according to my calculations this morning, that's about five degrees Fahrenheit um, above the average of what it used to be. So at that level, by the end of the century, um, that's gonna lead to significant changes to the natural systems that we all depend on, that our economies depend on for food sources, um, for um, heat and so forth. Um, that's gonna start to go haywire. So um, what we can expect in the US, um, I think it's going to differ from region to region, but in general, in the coming years, sea level rise, I think everyone knows, more frequent and severe storms, wildfires, extreme heat waves, drought, flooding, food shortages, changing disease vectors, and all of this um, is expected to bring costs and significant disruptions to the economy um, and the political system. One other thing I wanted to say about climate change is that I think it's helpful to look at it as a threat multiplier. So when we're looking at policy issues, we can't just say, oh, this is a climate change, this is caused by climate change over here. This is climate change, but this is not. Um, what it does is it takes vulnerabilities that exist and it makes them worse, um, which is, you know, it's difficult for policymaking, but um, that's what we're struggling with now. But today, um, since we're not gonna solve climate change in 40 minutes, um, I did, the focus of this panel is on one important part of the solution um, where I think that U.S. stakeholders can make a significant contribution. So although climate change is a global problem, many of the most promising solutions are happening at the very local level. Um, and we will be relying heavily in the coming years on human rights defenders that are working at the local level um, to to um, defend property rights, to combat corruption, to address pollution, to look at illegal logging and illegal mining. Um, these are the types of things that actually lead to benefits and help with this bigger climate issue, um, even though they're not necessarily climate issues per se. Um, and I would argue 
that these, this type of work on the ground level by human rights defenders is just as important to global climate action as, uh, as big fancy pledges made at annual climate change summits. But the problem is that, um, and I think the, the video touched upon this a little bit, um, human rights defenders face enormous amounts of violence in retaliation for the work that they're doing, um, especially those that are speaking up about environmental uh, land rights issues, indigenous issues. Um, each year, hundreds are killed and thousands more face other types of attacks, um, ranging from different types of harassment, death, thre death threats, criminalization, um, uh, you know, it's smear campaigns, a whole range of efforts intended to try to silence them. So the question is, for this audience, hopefully, why should the US government and US business play a role in, respect, in responding to this violence? One argument is moral. Um, and I wanted to quote Senator McCain again from a 2017 op-ed he wrote um, when he said, uh, quote, we are a country of conscience. We have long believed moral concerns must be an essential part of our foreign policy, not a departure from it. But there are also practical uh, reasons for supporting human rights defenders as part of foreign policy and national security. And that's what we're hoping to explore a bit today. Um, so we want to look at um, some of the ways that these very local efforts of human rights defenders um, contribute and advance US foreign policy interests and how stronger protections for these defenders can help to advance US interests as well. So now I'm going to introduce our experts. So starting at the far end, we have Melanie Greenberg. Melanie is the Managing Director for Peace Building at Humanity United, a foundation dedicated to cultivating the conditions for peace and freedom. She previously served as CEO of the Alliance for Peace Building. Melanie has helped design and facilitate public peace processes in the Middle East, Northern Ireland, and the Caucasus. And she's a frequent writer, lecturer, and trainer in the areas of international law, international security, and peace building. Then we have Alfred Brownell, who is an internationally recognized environmental rights activist, the president of the NGO Global Climate Legal Defense, or CLIDEF, and the, the Father Robert Dreenan Chair in Human Rights and a visiting professor at Georgetown University Law Center among many other <laughs> hats that Alfred wears. Um, for more than two decades, Alfred has advocated for the protection of the environment and human rights in West Africa, both while living in Liberia and now while living in exile in the United States. In 2019, Alfred won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize for his work protecting tropical forests in Liberia from harm related to palm oil development. And then closest to me, we have Sarah Gardner, who is the senior advocacy lead at Frontline Defenders, an international nonprofit organization that protects human rights defenders who are targeted with violence and other attacks. In her role, she leads Frontline's engagement with the US government and US-based multilateral organizations. And she previously worked on human rights issues in a number of other civil society and governmental roles, including as a US State Department Foreign Service Officer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I have a series of questions. And Sarah, I'm going to start with you on this. Why should we, as US policymakers and stakeholders, care about the efforts of local human rights defenders in other countries um, to safeguard their local environments? Um, thanks so much, Kirk. And thanks to the McCain Institute for um, hosting um, what we hope will be a, a really rich uh, discussion this afternoon. I'm really happy to be here um, with my fellow panelists. Um, I think I see um, pr protection for at-risk human rights defenders as a really core national security priority because without the defenders that are on the front lines, it's really impossible to achieve shared policy goals in virtually every other area, whether that's um, you know sustainable development, anti-corruption, good governance, environmental stewardship. Um, the progress in these areas can't be achieved without the leaders that are closest to impact communities that have have innovative solutions that are really doing the work that will seed lasting change. Um, and in preparing for this panel, I was thinking about an advocacy tour that I supported a couple years ago with human rights defenders um, from Mozambique. And they were kind of challenged with the same question. And one of those defenders said, well, you can't have African-led solutions without African defenders. So we're really talking about not just protecting, but resourcing and enabling like really, really critical work that spans the gamut of you know, every other area that the United States is interested in having principal leadership. Um, I saw this, I started my career, as Kirk said, 
as a foreign service officer. Um, my first tour was in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. I got there just a year and a half after the culmination of a pretty violent civil war. And I saw firsthand how rights defenders were really critical to a durable peace um, in, in that country. And so it was women human rights defenders that were playing important roles as mediators. It was journalists that were you know, doing the work on kind of rebuilding an independent and independent press. It was folks that were really actively engaged with the electoral process and bringing in buy-in and consensus on the community and national level that helped seed the way um, for a nonviolent um, presidential election in 2015 and made it possible for, for other gains you know, to be built upon. Um, and it really is, and in my role, like not, not to adopt too transactional of an approach, but as a, as a foreign service officer, talking with those individuals that were really close to, to the issues and had, had the trust of their communities really expanded my, and therefore the US government's understanding of what was, what was really needed, what were the priorities beyond kind of a, 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 narrow, a narrow lens of uh, elites that were sitting, sitting in the capital. Um, and then I think there's also a business case to be made for support for human rights defenders. We've seen that in areas where there are restrictions on freedom of expression and assembly, it's not just harmful to the folks that are being targeted you know, um, for, for, for speaking out, but it leads to a more volatile investment climate. And so when we're taking steps to protect human rights defenders, that pays dividends you know, across, across other, other sectors and other, other, other interested, interested players. Human rights defenders, as I said earlier, often play a really critical role in facilitating uh, community consultation and buy-in for processes of change. And we've seen that when these voices are excluded or silenced or, you know, even, um, you know, and we'll talk upon um, some of the challenges and very real threats, including killings that human rights defenders play a little bit later, I think, in this panel. Um, that can lead to, you know, real fractures in trust uh, between communities and potential foreign investors and government, and that can lead to protracted legal processes. Um, you know, even sometimes we see, you know, areas of, of violent contention, um, and that makes it harder for, for, for us to move forward on, again, other areas of, of, of uh, shared interest. And I think really critically, um, I don't want to downplay the values-based approach. Um, you know, I, I joined the Foreign Service um, and see my role as an advocate really in line with like what we want to see as principled US foreign policy. And it's impossible for me to have a human rights-based foreign policy without centering and the voices of human rights defenders and doing everything we can as a government and as a nation um, to make sure that um, their work is protected and um, adequately adequately um, resourced. And it's been really heartening um, to see bipartisan support for this issue you know, throughout the years. Like this isn't a Democrat issue or Republican issue. This is like a critical US foreign policy issue. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tara. Um, Alfred, you also, as Sarah was saying, um, with really supporting defenders close to the ground and how that really um, was helpful to the US government and US embassies to understand what's happening and so forth. You have been close to the ground working in Liberia, West Africa, both on your own work and then with your um, networks across the continent. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, we want to thank the Markin Institute for inviting me. And also, I'm happy to be with my co panelist, Sarah, for knowing for quite a while and Kirk as well. Um, so um, I am an example of uh, what a defender is, right? Um, uprooted from my country, from my culture, from my food, from my family, um, because uh, I was involved in trying to defend the rights of indigenous communities and protecting the largest forest ecosystem in West Africa. And uh, that resulted into me now being imposed in exile, and I live in the U.S. with my wife and kids who are in exile because of the work I did um, in Liberia trying to protect communities and uh, forest ecosystems. Why is this such an important issue? Uh, human rights defenders are important conflict, governance, democracy, and rule of law indicators. They are the ones who are at the front line, who will know first and foremost, as one of my uh, Sarah indicated, when there's corruption, when there's bad governance, when there's threat, when there's misapplication of resources, um, and even when there's conflict evolving. Um, we see a situation where uh, it is the defenders who are at the front line, especially the grassroots defenders, who are forced to blow the whistle 
when the rivers are being polluted? Who will blow the whistle when there's degradation of the forest? Who will blow the whistle when uh, folks who are involved in honorable activities are engaging in those processes? Who will blow the whistle when natural resources like diamonds and timber and oil and gas are being used by honorable activities? They are the one who knows exactly what is happening at that level. And it is because of their work that they do at the front line that they begin to face reprisals. Because nobody wants anyone to indicate what is happening at those levels. And so it is important to protect defenders to ensure that they continue doing these processes. And why is this such an important policy issue for the US, for those of us who work like I come from Liberia, West Africa? Because for example, it will guarantee a level of stability if defenders are protected. If they are indicating clearly that there are actions that are occurring in their communities that will lead, for example, to forced displacement, that will lead, for example, to evictions, that will lead, for example, to mass arrests, that will lead, for example, to harassment, to intimidations. If they are the ones who are documenting what extrajudicial killings are occurring in those remote towns and villages, it is very important for the U.S. and others to be aware of those processes because these are the activities that lead to some of the implications that we're now seeing across the globe. I've always said this to my students, especially one issue concerning migration. The war is faced with a lot of migrations that come from very remote communities across the globe. Many folks don't understand why people are moving. But if people start facing uh, abuses, violations, intimidation, harassments, killings, theft of their land, if they are living in those communities where they are not able to use their land and resources to support livelihood issues, they are not able to be those places they will find where they want to go. They begin to move. And they start with a drip, and a drip, and a trickle. And the next thing you get to see, this large migration of people across the world. Some of those tensions that we now see that have become global security dynamics in terms of, you see folks, for example, like Africa moving across the Mediterranean, or maybe even here yeah, across uh, Latin and South America, where you see large caravan. Those issues start at those levels. And if we are not putting solutions where we are listening to the defenders who understand what is happening and they begin those movements, we now start facing the impact of those processes. And that's why I think US policymakers should start thinking about how can we focus on the problem at the source? At the source. So if there are actors, especially non state actors, who are involved in activities that are impinging and abusing and violating the rights of communities and defenders and indigenous people, it's important to figure out how to resolve those issues. It's not to say, well, these are far away, remote areas. We are not going to be involved in those processes. Eventually, those processes are going to come and impact all of us because all of us are linked to the geopolitical process across the, the, the globe. And that's why defenders are such an important indicator of, of, of whether there's violence, whether there's going to be conflict, whether there's going to be the lack of the enforcement of the rule of law. My own country is a clear example. Those of you who have followed situation in Liberia, you are aware, for example, how our conflict started off. Communities who felt aggrieved, who did not feel that they were protected by the laws, became angry, organized, mobilized, and started conflict. And we've seen a lot of that across the continent, especially in West Africa. In areas like Nigeria, in the Sahel region, we see how the climate crisis has exacerbated conflict. To the extent we start seeing non-state actors like you know, um, 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 terrorist group who are taking advantage of those situations. So if you don't protect defenders, and you don't solve the problem at, 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 at the source, you now start creating breeding grounds where, fact, where actors who have other motivation will take advantage of them. And that's why it is so critical to protect defenders because they are the ones who will blow the whistle to let you know that problems are starting off 
And it's important to pay attention to them and to support them at the source so that we are able to solve the problem at the source. Because what would be the alternative? If we don't solve and we don't prevent those problems by ensuring that we take defenders' issues into full consideration and we integrate them into policy processes, it means that when, they, when the impact is being caused, it causes a lot more. See how they respond measures to address migrations, to address immigration, to address conflict, to address terrorism. See exactly what that is causing. And all of those are linked to the situation because we have not been able to focus on the protection of the rights of the environmental defenders and the rights of communities who live close to resources that are being used to even fund some of these activities. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alfred. Um, and I think you raised a lot of good points that, Melanie, you probably want to continue to talk about of how the root causes of conflict and peace building and the role that human rights defenders um, and indigenous communities as well can play. Yeah, thank you, Kirk, and thank you to the McCain Institute and especially to Sarah and Alfred. I feel like I can just drop the mic now. <laughs> um, I 1,000% agree with the perspectives we both raised and Alfred, your own experience um, as a human right defender and for laying out all the consequences that can happen downstream if we ignore the, the work of human rights defenders and protect that work. I'd like to take a step perhaps backwards that I work in peace building and think a lot about who is actually making the peace, who needs to implement the peace, and whose voices do we listen to as we think about the bellwethers of conflict and the indicators of peace. And human rights defenders, environmental defenders, indigenous human rights defenders don't work in a vacuum. If you talk to anyone, they don't say, well, my job ends here and starts here, and I'm only looking at these issues. Um, Alfred and Sarah, as you both said, human rights defenders who are working in the environment are working at the intersections of governance, transnational crime, corruption, environmental protection, biodiversity protection. And furthermore, the areas where they're working are the common goods for the whole planet that where they're working in forests, in oceans, in marine lands, these are the places that are holding the carbon and that hold the keys to um, a future where we're not looking at two and a half degrees of climate change. So these defenders are themselves sitting at the intersection of so many other areas. In Colombia, which is one of the most biodiverse areas of the planet, also home to a conflict that spanned almost 50 years with environmental issues at the heart of much of that conflict. When President Santos was beginning to think about a peace process, he actually went to a group of community elders and said, do I have your permission to make peace in the country, to bring the FARC and government and military and police together? And the indigenous leader said to him, you're not only making peace between people, you're making peace with nature. And that really stuck with me because who is defending the rights of nature? Who is thinking in Colombia about the Amazon rainforests, um, about mining, illegal logging, um, about defenders who are being caught in the crossfire between uh, gangs and armed groups working in on the drug trade? Um, and so part of the implementation of the peace accords, not only the negotiation, but the implementation rests in the hands of human rights defenders. And the, pro and the success of peace processes in Liberia, in Colombia, in Central America, Latin America, and Asia depends on these defenders who are not only there in an advocacy role, but are also bridging divides and uh, resolving disputes locally. Um, we're very fortunate today to have in the audience, I think I saw her, Bina Lakshmi Nepram, who you also saw in the film. Just raise your hand, Bina, I see you. So uh, Bina leads a network of indigenous peace builders from around the world and held an extraordinary summit at the US Institute of Peace in April, which brought together indigenous leaders, many of whom are environmental human rights defenders from every continent. And what was remarkable when we talked with them I think has lessons for all of us throughout the world. The first was they have a seven generation view of change and environmental protection. So they are thinking not only of the next conflict or the next 50 years, but of seven generations. And I saw this personally, I was in British Columbia uh, this past September working with the Tlaoquiat tribe 
um, and community that lives in the, the largest um, temperate rainforest in the world. And when they think about um, harvesting trees for working with um, baking canoes, for building longhouses, they will take a strip from one cedar tree and then they will not bother that stand for another 250 years. And I raise this only as a way of thinking, if you're thinking 250 years ahead, you are thinking about storing resources in a very different way. You're thinking about resolving conflict in a different way. You're thinking about how you're working across communities to store resources that don't have strict boundary lines. And so the group that came together under Bina's leadership was bringing all of that wisdom around conflict resolution, about resource development, and what it means to network in a way that we can really learn from as we're thinking about defending human rights and defenders around the world. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, yeah, and I think that does raise a, a big challenge here for, for policymaking in the US um, on a number of issues, just how do you balance this seven generation view with the, the immediate short term gain that um, is in, built into the system in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I want to ask everyone now, um, so we've talked a little bit about some of the, the benefits that human rights defenders um, provide and the, that local perspective and how that really can feed into different, a whole different um, number of categories of, of policymaking. Um, but as I mentioned before, defenders face incredible levels of violence and retaliation. And those working on environmental issues are consistently, at least according to the data, um, facing the most attacks. So, you know, every year with the reports, um, it's often indigenous people, representatives of indigenous communities that are um, being murdered at the highest levels. Um, and you know this is happening in every country in the world. So I wanted to ask all of you, beginning with you, Alfred, um, in your experience, what kinds of patterns of attacks are human rights defenders facing in retaliation for their work? Uh, thank you. So um, I will start off by you know seeing a little bit of my own experience. So in Liberia, um, in the 2014, I was involved with uh, providing legal support. I represented more than you know um, 50 communities, about probably about 100,000 people um, who were trying to defend their forest land, and we're involved in a very serious campaign offering legal support. Um, we have filed a complaint to an international tribunal to try to stop the destruction of the forest in the home of the indigenous people. You have to understand what a forest is and what it means to, to defend us and indigenous people. This is their home, this is their livelihood, this is their universities, their pharmacies, their grocery stores. Everything you think about is what it depends on the forest. And then also that forest we're talking about, if some of you have had time to take a look at the map of uh, Africa, if you look at West Africa, you will see across West Africa, all north is complete desert. In the middle is the Sahel region, semi-dry, and all along towards the coast um, is green. But the greenest part of that area is Liberia. And that forest um, both serve as a buffer to prevent the encroachment of the Sahara Desert. But it's also one of the largest carbon sink to absorb carbon in that region. So we're trying to protect that resource. So we filed a complaint on behalf of communities, and then we got um, an international team to come and investigate what was going on. So we went to the site, it was a particular site, um, in an area in Sino called Tajun in Liberia, and there was a place where the indigenous folks were worshipped, it was called Palo Hill, and this is where the Tajuan people, the, the group of people of Tajuan would go and worship and provide pilgrimage every year. It has been for centuries and centuries, the indigenous folks to go and worship. A palm oil company went to the group, palm oil, signed contract with the government of Liberia, did not obtain the consent of those communities and tried to desiccate the area. And they were involved in trying to, to grow the palm. So we took the team to see what was happening. And we arrived at Palo Hill. And it was the site that the company had designated to put up the refinery for the palm oil. There was about about 50 or 60 uh, indigenous folks who accompanied us in the international team. And we arrived at the site. And as you are seeing the willing, the crying, I mean, the sadness to witness how 
the machines were breaking down their sacred areas. I mean, just think for a second, some of us, you know, if you were a Catholic, you know, imagine what this is if your church or if you were a Sikh or a Muslim, your mosque, your temple being abused like that. It was a sight. I, I can never take that image from my mind. But anyway, we documented our process. And the team decided to retrain on our retrained bike. Um, our vehicle was surrounded by 150 militias from the company, right, and workers um, who uh, said that uh, we are exposed what was going on. Not actually us, but the communities had exposed what this company was doing to the secret area of these folks. And so they surrounded my vehicle, about 150 of them, and they were trying to look for the lawyer who was representing these community people. And they're like, where is Brunel? Where is Mr. Brunel? And then someone identified me, and they surrounded my vehicles, and they started to chant and uh, threaten me. They were going to you know, kill me. They was going to cut off my head. They was going to take my heart, my brains. And they went on dancing war dances, and they lit up a bonfire, and then put up a pot on the fire, and they were threatening to cannibalize me. Um, I can never forget that scene. It was a very terrible scene as they encircled my vehicles and tried to harm me. But that is what many defenders face, that small experience. But for a local chief who came and did not agree for the, uh, the execution to go on, for the kind of balancing to go on, I'm able to sit here today to talk about the story. But across the globe, every year, a global wellness report not less than four defenders are being murdered per week. In Africa, a range of harassment, intimidation, arrest, criminalization, uh, defamation actions against defenders, false disappearances. As I speak, my organization, the Global Climate Legal Defense Network, we are offering legal support to activists all across the globe, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South America, who are facing a wave of criminalizations, the unimaginable, in detention, in false disappearances, just unimaginable. These are the kind of things folks are faced with. But beyond just the killings, the arrests, and the detentions, folks are being evicted from their land. Families are being threatened. People are losing their job, losing their livelihoods. I, in my country, Liberia, was referred to as anti-government. My very citizenship was being questioned, was being challenged. People are being referred to as saboteurs. This is the kind of nomenclature that many defenders across the globe are facing. A total stigmatization. And even to the extent where the media, the media is used to stigmatize defenders. There is a narrative that is written for defenders. If you see, you feel that they are criminals. But these are the folks who are said, are out there protecting lands, rivers, streams, um, the oceans, our air, they are the ones who are making the ultimate sacrifices, but they're being slaughtered with impunity. Imagine what it is for someone to put their life on the line to protect the planet, and yet they've been slaughtered and killed. Many of the defenders who've been killed across the globe, they are yet to carry on any kind of investigation to address the stupidity from Latin America, the situation of Alberto Cassidy, and many other defenders who have been killed across the globe. And I feel this is time, for example, that many governments start figuring out exactly how do we address those issues of impunity. Because I feel trying to go after and kill those who are protecting the planet, to me, should become a matter of international concern. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alfred. Uh, Melanie, would you dare to follow that? <laughs> Maybe speak about the perspective of indigenous communities and what they're facing and some of the work that you've seen. Or well, Alfred, I can't get that image out of my mind. And the trauma that you experience in your family just ripples across so much. So, so, so thank you for sharing that. And it's exactly what you talked about. It is the impunity that by definition, so much of this work happens out of public view and by design. And human rights defenders are being targeted by their own governments, because often governments are in league or, or beholden to the constituencies that are grabbing land. There are deep economic incentives, political incentives. 
Often human rights defenders are from more marginalized groups within their own countries, already victims of conflict, and so are targeted by the government. They're targeted by international criminal networks who stand to gain from the resources, which could be palm oil, gold, logging, um, uh, uh, rare earth minerals. Now they're being used in all of our cell phones. And it is extraordinary to me, just what you said, that there isn't more public awareness, that we're not bringing this to light, that there's not outrage, that there isn't um, a good international enforcement mechanism for punishing perpetrators, and that we are all complicit. And what do we need to do to highlight the work of these defenders who are putting their lives in the line um, and are holding up not just the rights of their communities, and that itself is a lot, but an international rule of law. And if we take seriously the values around democratic voice, lack of extrajudicial killing of justice, this has to be much more in our remit as the international community. Um, yeah, it's hard, hard to follow, Alfred. <laughs> um, I've heard your story a few times, and I'm just I'm always just struck by I was just struck by it. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm about a month out. So every um, other year, um, Frontline Defenders has a convening of human rights defenders from around the world in Dublin. Um, and this was uh, ours. This year was about a month ago. 105 human rights defenders uh, from around the world uh, came together to share their testimonies, uh, best practices, challenges. And the final day is very powerful. It's um, human rights defenders take turns sharing personal testimonies. You know, ranging from you know five, five or so minutes, just talking about their struggles, what they've been hearing. Um, I had to. I don't know if there was a single person in that room that didn't have to take a moment to kind of sit with the emotion, the, the tenacity. Um, you know, these are people facing seemingly insurmountable odds that are still. They were all going to get on that plane and go back to their countries of origin and continue that 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 really important work. Um, Frontline Defenders puts out a global analysis every year. Um, tracking trends of threats against human rights defenders, um, trends across regions and in countries, um, and we're in the drafting period this year. Um, according to last year's analysis, at least 300 human rights defenders um, were killed in 2023, and 79% of those killings were documented um, in the Americas region. Um, indigenous rights groups were among the most targeted, with 92 killings um, documented of indigenous rights defenders um, in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, Indonesia, Mexico, Nicaragua, Philippines, Paraguay, and Peru. And we also um, documented killings of 64 environmental and land rights human rights defenders. As terrible as that statistic is, um, it's even more sobering knowing that it is almost certainly incomplete. Um, and I've talked with Alfred a lot about underdocumentation of threats against rights defenders, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's, and, and to Melanie's point, it's often um, rights defenders are marginalized within their countries, within their communities, might not have that access to protection mechanisms, know how to contact a diplomatic mission or an international NGO that can shine a light. So I know that that 300 number is shocking and we all should be shocked by it, but it's that the real number is much, likely much, much higher. Um, I don't want to repeat what my co-panelists have already shared, but just some takeaways that I really took from the Dublin week is I felt like almost everyone I talked to had some sort of criminal case against them. So we're really seeing an increase in criminalization of human rights defenders. And a worrying trend for me is weaponization of counterterrorism and anti-money laundering statutes to silence legitimate work of civil society organizations. And I also noticed um, a rise in um, targeting and criminalization of human rights defenders that are accompanying migrants. Um, and some of these people didn't even think of themselves as a human rights defender. They're like, well, I'm a humanitarian. You know, I'm just providing humanitarian services, but now I'm getting these criminal charges against me. Um, and it's, you know, really hard to continue your work while you're under that amount of stress. Um, I don't know that we think about this as a threat against human rights defenders, but the just the psychological aspect of all of this and something that I, I really value about frontline defenders is resources put aside by the organization to give human rights defenders a break and to maybe take some rest and respite in Dublin. It's just the constant stress that you're operating under. And what I talked to folks that was really the most difficult for them was targeting of their families. And so it's their people of incredible conviction that, you know, are often okay with bearing, not, I don't want to say okay, but you know, have kind of made their peace with like bearing the costs of their, their own activism. But then when you're going after their children, you're going after their spouses, you know, that's when it gets, uh, gets more, um, gets more complicated. 
Um, I also want to height that there was, you know, there's a, another takeaway for me from Dublin is there's a growing number of human rights defenders that are having to do their work outside of their um, home country, operating in extremely closed political contexts. So we're thinking about Afghanistan women human rights defenders that are operating out of Pakistan, but they're still not completely out of harm's way. And we're seeing increasingly savvy um, acts of transnational repression. And I think it's also increasingly difficult, and not that it was ever easy, but to talk about protection for human rights defenders without also talking about migration and individual rights to asylum access and protection and flexible protection mechanisms for human rights defenders on the move. Um, I was just chatting with a colleague about a potential uh, Rafael Monk case of a Afghanistan he woman human rights defender from Pakistan. And so what that means for like having meaningful um, pathways to protection. Um, and then just finally want to make a point about um, in restrictive regulatory environments in the broader civic space ecosystem. You know, we've been seeing a proliferation of foreign aid and acts around the world, starting with Russia in 2012, which makes it harder for civil society organizations to access foreign funding, makes it more difficult for diplomatic missions to be engaging in support of human rights defenders. And so we're seeing both like a more dangerous physical environment um, for human rights defenders and a really complex regulatory environment as well. So just kind of hostile all the way around. And I think we're going to be talking about opportunities, which might be more uplifting than you know talking about all, all the all the threats and um, you know really worrying trends that we're seeing. But I think this this is kind of getting together and thinking about how we are creative and how we're resourcing and and, and protecting is where there's some uh, um, some bright spots that we can come around. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we have five minutes left. So now that we've hopefully <laughs> thoroughly depressed everyone. We're gonna to try to uplift you in five minutes. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna ask everyone to, to go through, beginning with you, Melanie, just um, maybe highlight one or maybe two um, solutions. What can we do about this? So I feel we are at the intersection between two systems right now in the world. There is the existing human rights system, which I believe is breaking down. And there are these green shoots, new kinds of networks, new kinds of collaboratives that give me a lot of hope where we're seeing human rights defenders from around the world coming together in transnational networks that could be a counter to the kind of authoritarian playbook that we're also seeing moving transnationally. And what does it mean for those of us in policy positions and donor positions to support those networks where human rights defenders can give each other hope, resources, strategy, respite, planning, and that those networks are themselves highly political, creative, um, safe spaces where new kinds of systems of protection could develop. So what can we do to think more about these informal networks of protection? Um, I think uh, um, it's important uh, first and foremost to be able to um, ensure that defenders are involved in international policy processes, especially at multilateral levels. There's a big conversation around how do we respond to the climate crisis? How do we address species extinctions? But those conversations are occurring in the absence of those who are at the front line, who forces are extremely critical, those who carry the largest burden of the impact. So it's important that those, those voices are recognized that they have a seat at the table. But I think what is also very important is to ensure the protection of those folks you know, I consider defenders has the firewall uh, that in their way will address democracy deficits, the rule of law deficits, conflict deficit. So if we are able to build the firewall around them and, and support and strengthen them, I believe that we are beginning to try to strengthen democracy across this world because they will be the foundation of democracy in the community and accountability if we try to support and address them. Thank you. I guess I will um, kind of take a more just focus on some of the policy solutions. Um, so I think right now the way that the U.S. government approaches um, protection of human rights defenders, it's very ad hoc, it's very siloed, and sometimes you know someone that works on a fair amount of you know case specific advocacy, it almost feels like we're reinventing the wheel every time we engage a U.S. embassy on protection for a human rights defender. 
Um, it's often kind of, I think, a little bit personality driven. Like if you have someone that really cares about this issue at a U.S. mission and they're really motivated to be engaged, um, you know, maybe they're going to be very responsive or they have an ambassador that is really championing like human rights as a cornerstone of what they're trying to achieve. You get better outcomes. But then that person rotates or you maybe get someone that's like differently motivated or has a different set of directives and it can be almost like starting again. So I think we need to move more towards a whole of government approach where protecting human rights defender, defenders is centered as a very critical national security um, priority and appropriately resourced as such. So kind of elevating who we're tasking with leading on this away from like the entry level, um, you know, like like I was a first tour officer that was just kind of learning the building and how to, you know, how to maneuver the interagency and have that more centered at like at, 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 a, at, a, at a core leadership level and have this be like a priority for really not to be too cheesy, but like every foreign service officer should be thinking about this, whether you're working on commerce or you're working on, you know, defense relations. And sometimes it's even the folks that are working on trade, working on working on defense that are best positioned to be recognizing threats to rights defenders and then communicating that backwards. And I think there needs to be better lessons learned in between uh, regional bureaus um, and, and kind of building off uh, building off of there. Um, so to that point, um, there is a really great bill called the Human Rights Defenders of Protection Act uh, that was introduced um, through the leadership of Senator Cardin and Representative McGovern that really outlines a lot of, um, you know, kind of speaks to this, that would, if the bill was passed, it would require creation of a national strategy on human rights defenders, um, would create more senior positions to be resourcing this work, a category for visas for um, rights defenders to enable them to travel, you know, out of their country when they're facing threats and then return um, and uh, have more standardized reporting on threats to human rights defenders in annual um, chapters of the State Department's uh, human rights report. Um, and so I think that really lays out a blueprint um, for how we might consider moving forward um, and then really echo the, the good points that my co-panelists made about strengthening protection mechanisms, leaning into collective protection, and really taking our cue from, from what's working um, from, from those most impacted. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so we are now at time, so I will just uh, leave you all with one final request, which is that um, no matter what issues you are working on and concerned about, um, there's probably human rights defenders that are involved in some way or other. So all I ask um, is that you please going forward, um, continue to consider how human rights defenders play a role in your work and what um, types of protections, as Sarah was saying, that we can add into that. Thank you all for the panelists for sharing all your experience and um, thank you all for listening.